things he said he would, and now he's working to corrupt Egypt. So if you ever had any anger at Obama, now's the time to really make sure that it's there, because this is legitimate. Anyway, now we'll go to uh, CG13. Here's a new one that just came out January 31st. Um, Boston, documents in a lawsuit against United Airlines, which claims which claim negligence and security leading to the 2001 September 11th attacks show a United flight attendant spotted one of the hijackers on a Boston bound flight 12 days before the attack. Flight attendant Greg McAleer was working United flight four or 514 from Chicago to Boston on August 20th, 2001. McLair uh, testified to investigators from 9-11 Commission that he was greeting passengers as a man in casual clothes displayed a jump seat pass. The United issued such a pass to pilots from other, other airlines. It allowed them to ride as passengers in the jump seat in the cockpit. The, the, the flight's pilot would not let the passenger sit in the jump seat because he did not have proper ID, but he was allowed to fly as a passenger. Anyway, it just goes on and on and on. We, we find out stuff that the 9-11 Commission never followed up on. Here's, a, here's one that you know, you'd consider bad for our movement. Take a look at CG8. Uh, the loose change filmmaker Corey Rowe, 27, of Juanita, was arrested Thursday by Juanita police and charged with the sale of heroin. This is CG number eight. There you go. And I figured I'd put that up because somebody's going to say, yeah, did you know your guy was selling heroin? I don't know if he was or not, but he got busted for it. And it says here that uh, he was an Army veteran and produced the, the 2006 film Loose Change, a documentary questioning the official explanation of 9-11. Anyway, so I don't know if that's an attack on people who did Loose Change to try to discredit that or not. But, wow, we did a pretty good job. We got through most of this and... Oh, what looks like just under 20 minutes. And uh, so now what we're going to do is show you a little bit more of that David Chandler uh, DVD that we showed last time. I'm going to show the first. The first cut will be, the. it's a three-parter. Each part is roughly 10 to 15 minutes, but we're only going to play one, maybe two parts of it. And uh, the first part, this is the uh, David Chandler going to the NIST hearing on their, the, the, what do they call it, the Building 7, the, the pre-publication hearing on that. That's where he cornered them and asked them about the easily quantifiable values that you could measure from the video and how could they ignore free fall. And he forced them to go back and rewrite their report to include free fall. So when you get a chance, roll that DVD and enjoy. This is about 15 minutes report on Building 7 in August of 2008, one of the things they did was to have a technical briefing. And uh, at first I thought, well, no way am I going to be accepted to give, um, to ask questions at this briefing because it was limited to engineers or scientists with institutional um, uh, affiliations of some kind. But I went ahead and um, applied anyway. And guess what? I was given a password, and just five minutes before the briefing started, I was enabled to uh, submit a question, which I did. So uh, this video uh, that's upcoming here is, uh, shows a little bit of what happened at that briefing. In August 2008, after a seven-year delay, NIST, the government agency charged with investigating the World Trade Center collapses, released the draft of their final report on the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 for public comment. In that report, they claimed that the time for the building to fall, the first 18 stories, that's the part of the collapse visible on many videos, was 40% longer than it would have taken had it been in free fall. I responded with a video posted on YouTube called WTC7 in free fall, in which I showed that for approximately two and a half seconds, Building 7 fell at a rate indistinguishable from freefall. Furthermore, in that video I showed that NIST's methodology was not a valid way to analyze the true motion of the building. NIST's measurement was not just wrong, it was fraudulent. Then on August 26th, NIST staged a technical briefing in which engineers and others with technical credentials could pose questions. I'm a high school physics teacher, 
so I figured I would be excluded. However, I went ahead and registered, citing my membership in the American Association of Physics Teachers as my professional affiliation. By the way, I am not speaking for AAPT. That was just my passport into the briefing. To my surprise, my credentials were accepted, and I was able to pose a question. Here's a little of how it went. Our next question comes from David Chandler of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, any number of competent measurements using a variety of methods indicate the northwest corner of WTC7 fell with an acceleration within a few percent of the acceleration of gravity. Yet your report contradicts this cl claiming 40 percent slower than free fall based on a single data point. Uh, how can such a publicly visible, easily measurable quantity be set aside? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Uh, any number of measurements using a variety of methods indicate the northwest corner of WTC7 fell with an acceleration within a few percent of the acceleration of gravity. Yet the report contradicts this, claiming 40 percent slower than the free fall based on a single data point. Well, um, the first of all, um, gravity is the loading function that applies to the structure, uh, at, uh, applies, to this, applies to every body, every, all bodies on, uh, on, uh, on, on this particular, uh, on this planet, not just um, um, in, in ground zero. Whoa, I'm used to responses like that on a physics exam when a student hasn't even bothered to open the book. But this is NIST speaking, so let's continue. Um, the, uh, the analysis showed there's a difference in time between a free fall time. A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. Uh, and if you look at the analysis of the video, it shows that the time it takes for the 17, uh, for the, uh, the, the roof line of the video to, do, to uh, collapse down the 17 floors that you can actually see in the video, below which you can't see anything in the video, is about uh, 3.9 seconds. What the analysis shows, and uh, the structural analysis shows, or the collapse analysis shows, it's that same time that it took for the structural model to come down from the roof line all the way for those 17 floors to disappear is um, 5.4 seconds. It's uh, about 1.5 uh, uh, seconds, or roughly 40 percent more time, for that free fall to happen. And that is not at all unusual because there, there was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. And you had, uh, you had a sequence of structural failures that had to take place and where everything was not instantaneous. Buried in all that verbiage, what Dr. Sundar is saying is, free fall for the 18 stories under consideration would have taken 3.9 seconds. However, their computer model simulating collapse required 5.4 seconds. The slower collapse time was to be expected since there was structure supporting the building as it fell, slowing the fall, that there was a progression of failures that had to take place, and that these were not instantaneous. All of this makes sense as long as you don't look at the evidence. The evidence shows that free fall actually occurred, but since their computer modeling could not come up with a scenario that would allow for free fall, they had to declare free fall out of bounds and try to cover up the evidence. The problem is, unlike the columns and girders buried deep inside the building, the motion of the building is right out in plain view. Since their model predicted 5.4 seconds for the 18-story collapse, they dutifully conjured up a 5.4 second measurement to match. They had to stretch themselves to do it, but they did it. They found the disappearance time then they went out of their way to pick an artificially early start time, exactly 5.4 seconds earlier. This they compared with free fall time. This next question comes from Dr. Stephen Jones. Uh, NIST discusses the fall time for WTC7 on page 40 of the summary report, where uh, it stated, assuming that the descent speed was approximately constant. However, observations uh, by others of the descent speed show that the building is accelerating uh, rather than uh, being at constant speed. Uh, so the question is, why did NIST assume that the descent speed was approximately constant? 
Stephen Jones was calling attention to the obviously erroneous claim on page 40 of the draft report that stated that the building descended at constant speed. I'm sure constant speed was a simple misstatement. The correct response should have been, whoops, we'll fix that. But no, here's how they handled that question. Um, force of gravity obviously is, uh, uh, the acceleration of gravity is uh, what's uh, at the driving force and uh, uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that um, uh, time was uh, established from the um, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame. Um, um, search of the of the uh, time, so that was down to one thirtieth of a second. Um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared. Uh, we found that um, that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds. I didn't hear a whoops in there, did you? This is John Gross, one of the lead engineers for the NIST report on the collapse of the Twin Towers. He has a PhD in structural engineering from Cornell University. He taught engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He has a long resume on top of that. Don't you think he probably knows the difference between speed and acceleration? Don't you think he could explain it with perfect clarity if he wasn't so preoccupied trying to cover his tracks? Don't you find it interesting that the 5.4 seconds he measured for the collapse time just happens to exactly match the theoretical prediction of their model? That kind of precision is incredibly rare when modeling real-world events. Incredible is the right word. It's not credible. This measurement has all the characteristics of what we call dry labbing, manipulating the data to fit a predetermined outcome. It's an ethics violation in science on a par with plagiarism. Any engineers engaging in this kind of sleight of hand should lose their licenses. The larger implication, of course, is dry labbing in this kind of investigation would constitute a criminal cover-up. After another round of quibbling, someone had to step in and bail out poor John. Can you clarify that? Uh, I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and correct in the final version of the report. Okay. Sure. That was August. This is November. The final version of the NIST WTC7 report just came out, and guess what? We have a revised analysis of the building collapse rate. Constant speed is out. Constant acceleration is out. Instead, we have three phases of collapse, with a whopping 2.25 seconds of absolute freefall. The irrelevant 5.4 seconds is still defended in the wording, but it plays no apparent role other than CYA for John Gross and Associates. So free fall is hereby official dogma. How are they going to handle all the ramifications of that inconvenient fact? Read on. It says, The three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST's NC Star 1-9. That's it. Free fall went from an impossibility that required backflips in logic to obfuscate a simple fact to be measured then declared consistent with their fire-induced collapse hypothesis. Apparently they have now decided that free fall is okay as long as it is seen as a part of a longer stretch of time that covers the required 5.4 seconds. In other words, they dropped the bullying tactic of blowing smoke to obscure the facts and adopted an alternate bullying tactic, cover it with a lie and walk away. However, NIST cannot walk away from freefall. Now that NIST has certified freefall as fact, take a look at the implications. For those of you who don't have a, a lot of physics background, uh, one of the concepts that uh, might be a little bit tricky to understand is the difference between constant speed and constant acceleration. So I'd like to elaborate on that just a little bit here. Uh, constant speed is if you look at the speedometer on your car and it's holding steady. So if you're going down the freeway at 60 miles an hour, that's constant speed. If you're going down at 30 miles an hour, that's a constant speed. It's a slower constant speed. Okay. But if you're at a stop sign and then you start up, the speedometer is going to be increasing. And so as the speedometer needle goes up, if it goes up at a uniform rate, 
you're picking up speed and as time goes on you're picking